Welcome to this particular edition of the IRIS series, uh, IRIS, the Institute on Religion in an Age of Science. I'm delighted to uh, in, invite you to participate in this conversation this evening. Uh, the conversation is going to be around a topic that is absolutely fascinating uh, to me and I think to many, many people, because it, at one level it involves the most sophisticated science and the most uh, audacious engineering, both at the microscopic level, but also at, this, at the level of grand systems, combines all of that on the one hand with the um, dinner table. What's for dinner? It combines the aesthetic and indeed the spiritual dimension of standing beside the sea and watching the waves crash or watching the, uh, the, the activities of whales or fish in the waters with standing in front of the fish counter at the uh, grocery store and asking yourself, well, <laughs> what does that sign really mean there? That little sign that says um, um, responsibly sourced. Well, these are the questions that we're going to explore tonight with one of the most uh, uh, world's foremost experts in the field of aqu aquaculture. The turn to the engineering of systems in uh, along coastlines, particularly for the uh, raising of fish and other forms of seafood, including uh, even forms of seafood that have yet to make their way onto the dinner plates of most of us in the West. Our guest speaker tonight is Barry Costa Pierce, Dr. Barry Costa Pierce. Before I say just a word more about him, let me call your attention to the Q&A function the question and answer function. Uh, after uh, Dr. Costa Pierce uh, speaks, and after we have a brief response from Dr. Jane Ward, we're going to open this up to uh, participation from anybody who has uh, joined us for this webinar. Go down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see Q&A, click that link, open it up, type in your question. I have a feeling we'll have uh, quite a few questions tonight uh, because of the uh, multi-dimensional level of tonight's topic. Dr. Barry Costa Pierce holds the Henry L. and Grace Doherty Endowed Professor of uh, Ocean Food Systems, holds that chair uh, together with the program coordinator of the uh, University of New England Graduate Program in Food Systems which I understand is in partnership with universities in Iceland. He is a marine ecologist with broad experience and broad, uh, 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 a broad experience and, and broad uh, collaboration around the world, having lived in various places from, uh, from Iceland and Scandinavia to the islands of the Pacific. His current research is on um, the bioengineering of seaweed aquatic uh, aquaculture systems. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to tell us more about that. In other words, uh, aquaculture is not simply about the, the large fish, uh, salmon, for instance, but about a, a range of uh, uh, products that are uh, available from the sea, uh, possibly sustainably produced and um, uh, available through uh, aquaculture. Uh, Barry has served for 20 years as the editor of Aquaculture, the top scientific journal in the field. He is also, um, and this is a very high honor indeed, he is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So uh, Barry, we're gonna go over to you now and uh, you're going to present and then uh, we'll come back to me for just a second before we uh, go on to uh, Jane Ward. But Barry, we're ready for you. Please go ahead.
Barry, Barry, you're not muted, but but we can't hear you. Okay. How about now? And can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So let me uh, sort of repeat myself a bit there, apologies. Uh, what an honor it is again to speak at the Institute on Religion in the Age of Science. Uh, we convened a few years ago uh, with the climate on the climate crisis at Star Island. And I would like to encourage a lot of my science colleagues to investigate IRIS intensely because the faith-based community are our allies in using solid science-based information in order to work together on the climate crisis. So today, I, I, and also I'd like to say at the same time, they, these are our science, at, these are the religious organizations in the parliament of the world's religion that the IRIS is, is part of also. These are our allies in moving forward to meet agenda 2030 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so today I'm only going to, a lot of us are talking about the, the great challenges of our time, food, energy, water, waste, and shelter. And tonight I'm going to talk about food and how we can imagine food systems evolving in the future, particularly at 70% of the planet, uh, the world's ocean. Okay. So I'm going to rapidly go through some of these and leave plenty of time for questions because this seafood is, is mired in complexity and nothing I could talk about today uh, has sort of is, is simple or straightforward and, and, and doesn't have a, a local iteration and a global iteration. So we're in the United States, particularly I'm gonna address here, all the United States is connected intensely to the global seafood system. Where's it come from? Uh, rapid climate crisis changes are occurring in the ocean that affect our seafood si uh, systems. Uh, where, what is aquaculture growing food in water? Where does it play in the world right now in the year 2021? Yes, it may be a traditional enterprise, thousands of years old, but where is it at right now? What's its, what's its potential? What are some the the press reports? Is, is there teasing out the reality from some of the hype and some of the concerns and some of the downright fears that the coastal public has in the world today about the future of aquaculture? And last of all is, thinking about if we were to move forward with an expansion of these very valuable systems for human health and wellness, how can we look at what the public needs to know and how to get an accelerated social license to operate? So where does our seafood come from? If you live in any of the states in the United States, in the American jurisdiction, your seafood comes from elsewhere. It comes from exports. So if we look at this, I'm sorry, it comes from imports, not from exports. So if we look at the trade deficit and the acceleration of imports into this country, we see that about 90% of all of the seafood eaten in America is imported. And it leads to a balance of trade deficit, which is very large. So US balance of trade deficit pretty much goes as oil you know, cars, manufactured goods, but then right after that becomes seafood. Seafood is the most widely traded food commodity in the world, and America sucks up a lot of the world's seafood. And an amazing variety of seafood enters our shores. Go to any of our retail markets and, and you look at the country of origins, which by the way, one of the regulations is that when you go to a seafood retail store, we have something called cool labeling, country of origin labeling, it has to tell you where it's from. And uh, if it doesn't, then you have, as a consumer can say, you, you know, you need to do that, but you'll see that most of it comes from elsewhere. So our seafood supply has been actually, people ask me all the time, they say, you know, we hear about the crisis in seafood. You know, they were running out of seafood. The, the oceans are, are being emptied. Well, you don't see that in US markets. So if you look at this graph, you'll see that see actually the seafood supply for human consumption has actually been, that black curve has actually been increasing. 
And that's because of the accelerating amount of inputs, imports into this country. And as you can see, our exports are either flat or declining. So where's all the seafood coming from? And if you can see that top circle, it almost goes right off of the slide. It's coming from east of Iceland along the Norwegian coast, upwards in Northeast Greenland in a place called the Barents Sea. The cod have been sort of because of climate change and haddock, a lot of the ground fish have been moving rapidly up into this area. And the stocks in that area have actually, for all of what you've heard, have been exploding. And I'm gonna be talking about some big numbers here. And so I'm gonna talk about millions of metrics tons, okay? So just keep like one to 300 or so million metric tons uh, you know, in your mind. And as we go through this, about 1 million metric tons of white fish, cod and haddock now come from that area in that circle, east of Iceland, north of Sweden and Norway, the Barents Sea right now. And where is it coming? Well, it's being delivered in trade routes that are expanding and they're becoming greener and greener. They're decarbonizing. So this is the very expansive developing Icelandic shipping company called Aimskip. And the, if you look on our side of the, of the north, in the Northwest Atlantic, you'll see that the port home ports are in two in Newfoundland, in St. Anthony, Agentia, one in Nova Scotia, in Halifax, and the other one in Portland, Maine. So Portland, Maine is the home port for the Aimskip shipping line coming from Reykjavik. Now, a few things to just point out. Number one is with the melting of the Arctic and the warming of the Arctic, the most rapidly warming place on the planet. Second of all, probably is the Gulf of Maine. You see there's another shipping line that has gone to Nuke Greenland. That whole Greenland fisheries is rapidly developing also. So it's a shipping, uh, if you look at all of this protein, it's moving around in Central Europe through Rotterdam from the, the Iceland and actually Torshavan, the, the Faroe Islands, and it, it's, it's growing. So this is just even in the last few days, this is in Faroese, okay? Because the Faroe Islands, which is now becoming a, a major source of not only capture species, capture fisheries, but also of salmon. And of what a lot of people say is of salmon aquaculture that is, 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 sh is showing us how to grow salmon in a much more sustainable way. So the Loch Dura salmon, they, these, these now cutting edge salmon aquaculture companies, along with all this whitefish, particularly cod and haddock, are all coming towards the Northwest Atlantic. And you can see down on the, on the, on the bottom there, you know, two days, seven days, and then it, it, it lands in North America and is distributed by truck or short sea shipping vessels throughout the entire densely populated East Coast of the United States. Okay, so why is this happening? And this is a wonderful economic uh, graph at a glance. I'm going to tease it out for you to show you why this is happening, why these shipping lines are expanding and they're becoming much more economically viable because most of the world's goods are not being shipped by air. A lot of them as refrigeration and other you know, sort of goods that spoil such as fish very quickly, they're moving now on roll, 40 foot roll on roll off containers, short sea vessels, they're taking these products from long hauls and distributing them quickly to refrigerated trucks. So, you know, here I am as a fisheries and aquaculture research scientist, and I'm talking to you about logistics. So you cannot neglect trade because this graph, what it shows, the dots, the dots, the dots, the dots uh, go, the first one on the left side or whatever side it is, is, is that those dots, that is the equivalence of sending one kilogram of product by ship 
to from Portland, Maine to Reykjavik or that part of Iceland, all almost all of the west part of Iceland. That's the equivalent of sending one kilogram of that to that part of the world from Portland, Maine to sending it to New Jersey, to New Jer and the second one to Virginia, to third one to Georgia. So it's less costly to send one kilogram of product from Portland, Maine by ship than it is to send one kilogram of product by truck to New Jersey, Virginia, and Georgia. So we can ship one kilogram all the way to Sweden, St. Petersburg, Russia almost, and that is less costly than send less costly by sea than sending it to Georgia by truck. So this doesn't affect uh, the, uh, just us here in North America taking advantage with, with quotes air quotes around that of the warming seas. China is now in absorbing with the, the massive amounts of, of the expansion of the middle class and the massive amounts of income that the Chinese middle and Indian middle class have right now. Last year alone, they imported 70,000 metric tons of salmon from Norway. Okay, so that's where most of our seafood comes from. And you know, when you think about that, and you think about the ethics of that, you know, why are we, you know, sort of taking all of this product? Uh, why or why is this large trade deficit? You know, why isn't there sort of some a lot more in discussion about the indigenousness of this? You know, why can't we do this in, in jurisdictions that are as advanced as the U.S. with its economics, its scientific establishment, etc.? So it raises lots of questions, and those questions are not only science; they're also ethics. Okay. So I had to put, because I'm, I'm from Maine, so I had to put wicked in front of this. So wicked climate change is happening. And what is happening right now is these big, beautiful, tasty organisms that we've relied upon as a big part of our economy. We are in the midst of now a climate ocean resource crisis because it's, it's a monoculture. Virtually all the cod are gone as they're way up there in the Barents Sea and elsewhere. And our bottom of the ocean in the Northwest Atlantic from the Atlantic provinces to Maine particularly are dominated by lobsters. So there's hardly any species left that are being fished, 90% of the total value. It leads there, it's a fed fishery. There's massive amounts of bait that goes into traps here. And the, the big fear is there's about 5,000 or more, if we took to take Atlanta, Canada, fishing families in rural areas that have been damaged by political polarization, et cetera. And we are in a very, very fragile social ecological crisis right now being caused by cli the, the, the climate crisis. And there is no border as far as, although there's a political border, there is no border between Atlantic Canada and the US as far as lobsters are concerned. So a couple things to note, you know, although we're way down there, Maine, USA, and the rest of this is Atlantic Canada, Maine's lobsters har last har harvests went down 30% last year, a big drop. And way up there in northern Newfoundland, it had its highest landings ever. So pretty soon, sooner than we ever anticipated, that most of the lobsters are going to be seeking colder water offshore, putting our small boat fishery at great risk for their health and safety, or they're going to be moving completely to Canada. Now, from the market perspective, and with the pre recent trade wars, that we had to suffer in the last four years. Canada was buying lobsters because there's different seasons and it would meet its market demand for its export markets by buying from Maine. But you can see that with the trade situation, the lack of free trade with China and all of the, the tariffs that were put on, Canada won. So Canada couldn't even get enough lobsters 
but its exports to China skyrocketed and uh, because of their free trade agreements or their better trade agreements with less, uh, you know, uh, less tariffs. Okay, so is the ocean here in the Gulf of Maine empty? No. So the people are saying Newfoundland is looking more like Maine every day in terms of its ocean species. Maine is looking more and more like Rhode Island. Rhode Island is looking more and more like South Carolina in terms of the composition of the species that we see swimming here, the pelagic species, the ones in the water column. And this one is, is, is something that is, it's something that, that rocked our world. And these are two scientific papers from my colleagues uh, at the University of New England. These are spiny dogfish sharks. And it was estimated that 230,000 metric tons, okay? So remember we just talked about, you know, we have to get our heads around these numbers. All of China had 70,000 metric tons of salmon. That's a, that's a big number. So 230,000 metric tons of spawning, that's the females, uh, dogfish were estimated in of reproductive age in the Gulf of Maine. But another paper was found that that's just the females. And there was a four to one male to female ratio. So during some times of the year, the size of, of the total biomass of male and female predatory sharks, small sharks in the Gulf of Maine is something that it might be as high as 800,000 metric tons. So just keep that in your mind. So what's how much cod are left in the Gulf of Maine? It's estimated there's the standing stock biomass of cod in the Gulf of Maine, which we fight over all the time, highly regulated, might be as low as 20,000 metric tons. So how does the fishing, the, the existing fishing community, how do they respond to this? Okay, so spiny dogfish sharks for my colleagues that are from the UK that are dialing in right now. And I know at least one of my dear colleagues is dialing in right now. Uh, so these are, are rock salmon. These are a very dear uh, spiny dogfish shark fillets are very dear in the UK for fish and chips. So does that lead to new markets? Well, maybe those markets would have to be developed, the processing, the nets, everything would have to change for the fishing community to be uh, along with this. Then how about the, the those are the, 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 the swimming species. How about our deer oysters? And this is a picture uh, bef just before COVID. Um, we have a very robust oyster aquaculture market here in the Northwest Atlantic from Atlantic Canada down through, call it uh, 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 Southern Florida even. Um, but we started to see this, wild oysters being marketed in the midst of the aquaculture oysters. And a few days ago, there was this report in one of our local newspapers, Bangor uh, Daily News, because of climate change, wild oysters are starting to settle up and down our coast and may become a new fishery. And that would be positive in many ways, but it would also add additional market competition to the existing oyster industry. These are dramatic changes that no one uh, no one of us could have ever predicted would be happening in our lifetime because the, the cold Labrador current always kept Maine, you know, at 30, 43 to 50, 45 degrees north latitude, very, very cold. Okay. So how about aquaculture? Growing food in water. It's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, to unpack here. And again, I want to emphasize, we can't unpack it without talking about the large situation globally because we're affected by that. And what does that do to us locally, even hyper-locally? So let's, let's just look at some data. First of all, a lot of people, when, when we talk to as scientists, when they say, we say we're an aquaculture scientist, they just say salmon. I mean, it, almost, it, it takes the oxygen out of the atmosphere sometimes in a room when we say we're aquaculture scientists. But aquaculture is very diverse. China is, is one of the, well, it, as you'll see from the data, 
is not only historically, but today is the center of global aquaculture. And there's over a, a hundred or so species that are farmed in China. Now we don't farm that many, but you can see that there's not only fed fin fish, you know, we have to feed them just like any sort of terrestrial protein production system, they're fed. And then there's non-fed species, okay, which take the bounty of plankton and uh, uh, the organisms that grow wild in the ocean as their own food, or they don't require any food. They, they have nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus. So we have seaweeds, mussels, or bivalves, and oysters, and we could go on and on. And scientists in aquaculture are developing species as we, as we speak. Okay, so let's go to a little bit of the hype. A little bit of the hype you'll see in press reports on a regular basis. When people talk about the great future of aquaculture or they talk about um, you know, what's a new proposal for aquaculture in your community. So you'll see this. Aquaculture is just growing so fast that the world gets half of its fish from aquaculture. Well, let's really look at that. So how is aquaculture developing? Okay, so you can see that pretty much it's Asia. You just look at this graph, you know, the bottom of the, you know, the, the, the gold, 90% of all aquaculture production, fed and aquaculture and, and, and non-fed species comes from Asia, okay? And you can see almost everywhere else in the world, it's minor, okay? So no matter what you hear about, it's still incredibly pioneering in all of it, what we call its new geographies, which is really anywhere outside of Asia. It's still very unusual. Uh, the word has to be defined oftentimes when we begin to talk about it. And it, 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 it oftentimes gets trivialized. But if you are a scientist, if you are a, a developer who really wants to see aquaculture grow and, and provide more seafoods for humanity, and you live anywhere outside of Asia, you're a pioneer. It's still incredibly new. So another way of looking at this, China, 60% of all global aquaculture production is in one country. Now, granted, China has thousands of years of high, of densely populated coastal societies. And so some of the first fisheries regulations, you know, in China are, were published in ancient times. And so they've been having to develop aquaculture and farming systems since ancient times to meet their high population densities, not only now, but thousands of years ago, China was still densely populated. So they learned how to do this and provide for their own people. But the other thing is that I wanted to point out we in the West, with some minor exceptions, in Czechoslovakia, carp, okay, for, for Christmas, <laughs> we don't eat carps. And indeed, carps are considered to be an invasive that destroys you know, all of our, our natal aquatic ecosystems. But when you look at the world's top 20 aquaculture species, the top in six out of the top 10 are carps, and eight of the next 10 are carps, okay? And that gives you some idea if you, the, on the size and the uniqueness of the aquaculture situation in China. And so we as aquaculture scientists say, you know, what can we actually learn? And it's a big question. We can learn maybe about systems, but maybe when the, none of these species, at least on the carps, are not transferable to the aquaculture's new geographies throughout the world. So you don't eat half of your fish from aquaculture if you're outside of Asia. And I, I love this quote from Bobby Bragdon. If about 100% of aquaculture is in Asia and the rest of the world literally has no aquaculture, then according to this Bobby Bragdon quote, if I've got one foot in boiling hot water, and I got another foot in ice water, well, I'm getting about half of my fish from aquaculture and I'm feeling okay, okay? So nothing could be further from the truth. 
you, if you live anywhere in the world outside of Asia, half of your fish is not coming from aquaculture. Indeed, if we look at the EU 25 nations, the European Union and North American production, we see this dismal data. This is again in, mismal, uh, this is in millions of metric tons. Now, remember some of the figures we were just talking about. You know, we were talking about with those carps, we're talking about 20, 30, 40 million metric tons just for one carp. And, and these, this is the entire continent of North America, Canada and the US. So aquaculture is not developing here. A and why? Okay, that's the first one. So when next time you hear that hype in the press that you're getting half of your seafood from aquaculture, don't believe it. Second of all, Aquaculture is not the main source of fish, of fish, or proteins for human consumption. So this is a famous graph, which us is the scientists that are on the call, you know, love to talk to you about the controversies that we're bringing up tonight. But if you look at this graph, even though capture fisheries, which is the gold, has leveled off. And there's a big concern about that because this is global data, right? So we're taking the developed countries and the developing countries. Still, most of the world's protein comes from capture fisheries. Aquaculture is growing. However, almost all of that growth is in Asia. Very few countries in Asia. And we cannot define the future of aquaculture and food production because capture fisheries are completely poorly managed everywhere. They're, the, they're within the purview of a dying generation. We should go away from eating fish from, from fisheries because nothing could be further from the truth. Capture fisheries are having lots of problems in the developing countries. However, they probably are one of the greatest opportunities as a renewable resource to recover large amounts of protein at fairly low costs for the world of the future. So you can see in this diagram, no matter what you've heard, that although there's concerns, the amount of overfish stocks, mostly in developing countries, has been growing over time, still we know how to manage a renewable resource. We, we know how to sustainably fish fisheries without destroying the ocean. And where is the most of the concerns? So the, the gold, again, if, if you see the ones that I've circled, those are the statistical areas of FAO in the world, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, which are very, very concerned about, which are severely overfished. The Med, the Mediterranean, the the Pacific, the, the East Pacific, and uh, the, the Southwest Atlantic. There's concerns all around about capture fisheries, but please realize there's thousands of professionals that are working on recovering sustainable fisheries. And still, if you go into most of our retail markets in the United States, most of the fish that you're getting, the, fe the fin fish now, are from fisheries with the exception of salmon. Okay, so we're not getting most of our protein here, of, I'm sorry, fish in from, from aquaculture. We're getting it from fisheries right now. And there's questions about how that could change in the future, whether it would ever change in the future because it's such a large amount of fish. This other diagram shows that we're a meat eating world, okay? The amount of terrestrial meat that has been, that has been accelerating to way beyond the wildest imagination that terrestrial protein production people could have ever imagined. The, the red figure is China's explosion of, of meat consumption because of its growing middle class. Now remember the figures, if you can, of what I talked about before. Aquaculture and fisheries together were about 140, 150, 160 million metric tons. Look at that world figure. That's 300 million metric tons. 
So you can see here that we don't get most of our protein from fish or from seafoods. We get it from meat. And so that is very, very important on, I mean, when we tease out the future of aquaculture. So one of the first questions we should ask, is this a meat eating society? And uh, where are the fish eating parts of a meat eating society? Um, or we just, we flail at trying to develop markets where maybe there are none. Okay. So I'm gonna end on this discussion of, well, not end, I'm going to continue this discussion on aquaculture in, in the, the most priority discussion that we're having in the global community and locally in aquaculture is what kind of scale are we going to propose for expansion or to meet livelihood needs? So you hear a lot about the intensive, the global, the salmon, where is that going? Because as you can see, the salmon everywhere now, it's in China, it's, it's here, it's in Chile, it's in Costa Rica, it's everywhere. And how about us? the small communities, the rural communities throughout indigenous and non-indigenous nations throughout North and South America, and I should say in all of aquaculture's new geographies. Do these interact? Are they in conflict? Can they exist? So let's talk about the global intensive because this portfolio is trying to develop all of those trade routes extensively to meet needs. So the first one is salmon. This is what a typical fjord in Norway looks like with a medium size salmon farm. Open water, intensive salmon. Uh, each one of these pens could have anywhere between a half a million to a million fish with feeding barges there, okay? Open water, um, wastes are far below what they used to be, almost negligible because there's no, there's no more feed waste very sophisticated technologically. Okay, so a lot of concerns, a lot of concerns about open water that the, the future of, of mother ocean in terms of, of this loaded with nutrients, lots of coastal development, lots of how harmful algal blooms. So what the science community has been working on is closed systems. And these are closed systems, open water, closed systems that pump out the waste from the bottom. These beautiful Scandinavian eggs, I want murals on them. I told my Norwegian colleagues we should paint murals on. They said, no, they look Scandinavian, beautiful white lines. Sometimes we have a different you know, uh, idea of aesthetics. Um, and then uh, these concrete dishes. Um, so is it just over there because we're a global community? We're a global science community? No, it's here. It's coming to a place near you. So this is American Aqua Farms, a Norwegian company that is proposing these pens, these closed pens and pump out facilities uh, in along the coast of Maine. So the dialogue of, clo of open net pens to close systems in the ocean is occurring. So engineering advances very quickly. And then because of concerns about the coastal ocean, both from the public as well as because of coastal pollution. We hear about it every day. There's been a phenomenal development in Norway with these large scale open ocean farms. This is Ocean Farm One. Uh, the logistics, this is actually a picture of it that I took uh, when we were out there. Um, tremendous uh, integration of the oil and gas engineering infrastructure with food production uh, and a phenomenal opportunity for production. However, there's a lot of concerns about diseases getting out there. And then ships, Norwegian, again, engineering, naval architecture and naval engineering coming to food production in the ocean with these large ships, 2 million fish, 10,000 metric tons of, of farm salmon in one ship. Okay, so that's what's going on. Again, we're in big scale, big scale. So is it coming? Uh, those big scale systems coming to a jurisdiction near you, highly unlikely at this point, although there are proposals, highly unlikely. 
What's more likely is this happening right now, which is this is the proposed Nordic Aquafarms RAS recirculating aquaculture system on land, which is a, an intensive system for salmon. It basically uses all of the wisdom that has been gathered in the last 50 years on how to treat all the waste. Uh, it's not without discharge of water. Um, anywhere you can see 98% in this case. Some people say upwards of 10% is discharge. Lots of questions about uh, the capital costs, the sustainability of this, but look at these proposals, okay? This is just a list that I've got together on the ones that have been announced in the press or we know about. And so Norway right now from all those open net pens right now, all those no, open net pens, those big systems that I talked about, they're really not uh, you know, ready for prime time and commercial right now. They're still experimental, but those open net pens, yeah, that's the major way of, that, that Norway produces salmon that we get in all of our supermarkets. That's about two metric, million metric tons a year. So if the Americans develop these RAS systems, recirculating aquifers, that's gonna add another half a million metric tons. So it, it will be very significant to the salmon markets here, uh, indigenous markets here in the US. But there's lots of questions, lots and lots of questions. Um, these are very capital intensive. They're not 100% recirculating. They still produce lots of sludge, which either has to be landfilled or in some way disposed of. Um, some people talk about the circular economy and, and that they could be reutilized. A lot of that is still in R&D. Okay, so that's some of the large scale. How about, the smaller scale and the hyper local. And, and what about how does that play out in the US, this hyper local and small scale? Let me just reflect on this, for example, for, for, for a minute here. If you look at the, the traditional lobster fishery in Maine, I, mean, I mentioned about 5,000, 6,000 families. They, they have quite an amount of capital poise. They're extremely knowledgeable how to do operations on the water. And they're surprisingly open to maintaining their livelihoods as a year round livelihood. So rather than replacing fishing, can aquaculture contribute to coastal livelihoods? So we had to learn from somewhere because we're just starting this. And so a very progressive jurisdiction in the mountains just west of Maine called Vermont has been attracting tens of thousands of young people of very exciting innovations in their food system to expand and to look at their value chains and how to do this. And so one of the questions we've been asking is, hey, on value chain development and processing, we've got a lot to learn from our agro ecosystem people. So what's expanding is oysters. Oyster aquaculture is expanding dramatically. These little dots all up and down the coast are the, the green ones are new entrants, lots of new entrants in both oysters and in seaweeds. And they're marked, they're getting cash for these. It's adding to their livelihoods uh, and it's exciting. But I wanna sort of end my, my session today talking about our work with this, uh, seaweeds. Because seaweeds we think have a tremendous potential to add to not only our economy, to fishing livelihoods, but to human health and wellness and nutrition. So we've been talking about changing our lexion to turn them into sea vegetables. And we've got a lot of help. And some of that help is really, really wonderful now. Young people, a lot of women own businesses. I, I, I feature here, Brianna Warner, the C, CEO of Atlantic Sea Farms. She just was featured in Maine Women's Magazine because she won one of the 2021 Good Food Awards in San Francisco because they are now a major processor, product developer of all of these new innovative food products that are entering the market. Then we have the celebrity chefs led by one of the best of them all, uh, Barton Seaver, writing books, going, doing YouTubes, going on you know, the Oprah Winfrey kind of shows and talking about how these add to human health and wellness. And we can make good beer out of anything. We also have the evolution of retail. The first uh, that we know of 
retail seaweed shop uh, in the beautiful city of Portland, Maine. Again, adding to the, 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 uh, the marketing and a, a very large extension portfolio with lots of interest by the public to sort of eat, to think about, to, to understand seaweeds. Okay, so we decided that we were going to look at this from a science-based perspective. In, our, we, in front of our engineering colleagues, we put these design criteria. In order for us to integrate with the existing fishing community, we had to develop something that didn't conflict and it was easy for them to do where they could get cash coming to the dock and it, it, it involved all different age levels, including schools. So we had to put it in in the winter, which is, and make it survivable. And so we came up with this. We came up with a taut system, 200 foot lines, uh, about 30 to 40 feet below the water surface, survived over five summers. We called it five in a a farm in a box uh, because it could use a very small skiff um, a very short deploy deployment times, low cost, $600. And uh, over five years of success, you know, we could get about a, a metric ton, 1,000 kilograms on a regular one line, 200 foot line. Um, and it was very easy to get this. It's actually, this is farm in a boat. That's the entire, you know, farm there. Uh, the bioeconomics of this are squishy still. Uh, but they are developing, uh, particularly the, starting with the food market, flake markets, um, and there's a lot of innovation in this space. As the value chain begins to develop, you begin to see job segmentation. You see producers selling wet weight, then processors either drying or making value added pro products, and you see transportation networks, financial services begin to evolve. So. We've now developed a multi-line model and tested it in the ocean with very sophisticated engineering. We call this farm in a truck, uh, which again is not going so large at the, the square mile or square kilometer level. And this is the way we're looking at it. We're looking at uh, these would be sea vegetable food systems that would, because we have actually sea uh, weed harvesters who harvest seaweeds. They mostly ascophyllum or rockweed, and they can be turned into maybe full-time seaweed people, or the existing lobster community could do it in the winter. So this is the, <coughs> excuse me, social ecology of that, a livelihood approach, either seasonal or maybe turning some of these fishing uh, seaweed, uh, seaweed harvesters into year round. And what's amazing, is that is what actually happens in both in Europe and in Maine. Ni about 90% of all seaweeds harvested in both Europe and Maine are from fisheries. Uh, only Asia is, is, is harvesting it if almost completely from aquaculture. So last couple of slides here, hang on with me. So with this market development, so most of the large scale global is very similar in aquaculture these days, is very, very similar to the iPhone. We all didn't need, we didn't know we needed an iPhone. It was to, it developed, the technology was developed and then massive marketing went on. Well, similarly, a lot of the new species and a lot of the large scale aquaculture is, is, is still in the realm of technology development and markets projected. Whereas what we're doing is we're going step by step. We see the food market developing, and then we go from one line to two lines to three lines to five lines and, and develop the technology to meet the existing markets. So how are we going to garner an accelerated social contract for both large scale and small scale aquaculture in aquaculture's new geographies? Well, first of all, I call it the ecological aquaculture approach. Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Can, you know, convince the public as well as develop the science and the communications portfolio that we hopefully follow the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. Second of all, if we don't have the science, we don't go forward. We apply the precautionary principle and we go slowly. Now this is really very much apropos for the seaweed story. 
uh, there's too many proposals out there for very large square kilometer, square mile seaweed farms that you know, appear fanciful um, from a scientific perspective. Uh, the small scale, the, the small scale, uh, you know, hyperlocal seaweeds make a lot of sense. And then I mentioned, I think, a lot of these, would, but uh, the circular bioeconomy is, is growing. So how are we approaching this from the large scale with decision makers, with the coastal public? So this is a rural development model for the large scale salmon farms that the, the RAS people are, are working with us on, is to show the plan, not just for production, to show the entire social ecological system that could evolve if we could localize it. Now, certainly the production is large, so we will have to export, but more and more of this is that we can localize, we can create viable rural economies. So this is for decision makers to ponder when we, when we approach them. So when these RAS farms are being developed, look at this. So the opportunity would be to, to decrease the energy consumption and use renewable energies, to have all of the logistics, the trucking companies all together and the processing in one place. And then in the front of this facility, to have a complete education facility for the public so that they can, the, the children all through K through gray can learn about what this is going on. So I'll end here and we're going in the same route with the articulating the, what the future of sea vegetables would be and its, its merger uh, with the public. So thank you for joining. Thank you to the Institute on Religion and the Age of Science. I love everything that you do. And I wish you great peace, love, hope, and happiness. Thank you so much. Uh, we've been listening to uh, Barry Costa Pierce. Uh, and as you can uh, recognize readily, uh, one of the world's foremost experts on aquaculture. Uh, and we really appreciate the, uh, the comprehensive um, uh, approach that you've taken here. Uh, let me get my camera on the way I should have it. So thank you again, Barry. Uh, the qu question and answer function is open for uh, members of the webinar audience to uh, pose questions for you. Uh, I have some in mind and I'm, I see at least one is already on the screen. Uh, but we'll get to those in just a moment. First, we go, though, to uh, Dr. Jane Ward, who is going to reflect uh, briefly on what uh, Barry has just been speaking about. Dr. Ward is a retired U.S. Air Force colonel, uh, an ophthalmologist, MD, and uh, just fascinating array of interests, uh, heavily invested in her Cape Cod community, in local uh, issues there, but uh, the intersection of lifestyle medicine, health of populations, and the health of uh, human built environments. Uh, very well qualified, uh, Jane, to uh, get us going with our interaction uh, with Barry. So if you will go ahead, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Jane. Well, thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes, you're fine. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, well, Dr. Costa Pierce, my head is spinning. I've just, uh, I'm uh, actually very amazed and I appreciate your overview. And I think you've taken us um, on a very interesting tour from the these mega fish producing sites and, and more to come uh, with the, uh, on the back of the climate change changes that have moved our fisheries. Certainly Cape Cod is no longer able to find cod and you are no longer to find them in Maine. They've gone to uh, the North Sea. Um, I, I was actually gratified to hear that the 
volume of cod and haddock are still there, but the uh, industrialization of the process of, of capturing the fish and then shipping them back here, or the fact that our, our uh, most of our seafood in the US, I think you, I believe you told us 90% are coming, are, are imports. Those issues concern me a bit. And I think as um, we become more interested in where our food is uh, sourced and, and what is the uh, care given to our food, I see uh, it's a tiny portion of the, of the seafood eating Americans, but I see more and more leaning towards the very end of your talk where you started to talk about the sea vegetables. And that's the area that frankly intrigues me the most personally and the opportunity to um, have the culture of sea vegetables expand the livelihoods of the lobster fishermen in Maine or some of the other fishermen who are out of work further south from you to become uh, kelp farmers in the winter and maybe combine that with the shellfish farming, I think is a tremendous direction. And to me, has the opportunity to be uh, more of a, a social justice orientation to the fishing industry because it becomes uh, something that small fishermen and smaller communities can profit from. And I also wanted to share uh, my interest in uh, health and um, keeping people healthy rather than treating them once they're sick has gotten me into the sphere of looking at food as medicine and that we really need to be very careful about what we eat. There's a tremendous consortium that's evolved over the last several years between the Lancet Journal out of the UK and the Harvard School of Public Health and a, a broader group that you're probably familiar with of environmental economists as well as environmentalists. And their question was, what is the healthiest diet for humans and for sustainability of the planet for fighting climate change? And their, their final decision was the diet uh, consists mostly of fruits and vegetables and including whole grains, legumes, nuts. Consumption of poultry, eggs and fish should be modest. Consumption of this land-based meat that we love to grow in the United States should be little to none. I wonder how you see your uh, view of the, the future of sustainable aquaculture involving more sea vegetables, involving more shellfish, how does it fit into this goal of our experts who have come up with the healthiest diet for us? How do we move people in that direction? Um, certainly education is a part of it. Appreciate your thoughts on that. Jane, <clears throat> that was very insightful. Now food is medicine as um, it's a tremendous sort of not only like contribution to the future of human health and wellness. It's a, it's a challenge to these de new developing ocean food systems to take that on as their top priority. Because I feel, and a lot of us do, that the micronutrients that come, like are scavenged by seaweeds, are much more important than uh, and you know, some of them are still unknown of how important they are for human health and wellness from the medical community. But we know from the, from the indigenous people and the historical information and from some scientific papers, some of them quite old, you know, that it could be that you know, our brain development you know, was part and parcel of our large amount of seafood in, in, our, in antiquity. Um, so there's some really amazing papers from some of the indigenous people, you know, in South Africa, that you know they are eating large amounts of sea of seaweeds and large amounts of, of shellfish, led to the development of different parts of our brain, and um, so I, I I think it, it's a it's a powerful message that when we talk about 
you know, sort of do no harm. And we talk about do no harm to the, to the earth and or to be the, not to go way beyond the regulations, you know, to, to yeah. be the, the best in class and, you know, to avoid uh, all, at, at all costs, all toxins that could uh, damage human health and wellness. Now, these, these, are, these are high ideals. However, they're not impossible, even for the, the fed aquaculture species. There are, you know, some producers that say, absolutely, you can test our, our fish, you know, uh, and you can do whatever you, you need to do. And it's completely labeled, certified. It goes beyond the regulations. And um, it may be a little bit more costly, but you're paying full costs. You're paying for the cost of ecosystem goods and services. You're paying for the costs of education, for social sustainability. You're, 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 it's a full cost accounting. So shouldn't we actually have some of these incredibly valuable proteins more costly? We don't want, you know, really cheap fish. You know, we want, we want to know the people, we want to know the communities. You know, we want to support rural development, sustainable rural development. And, and I think that's where you're going, Jane. You're going into like this, you know, having the economists and, and, all, and all of us work, you know, for the, the next stage of social, ecological, you know, sort of micro, uh, like food as medicine. And to me, the most valuable foods on planet Earth come from the ocean for human health and wellness. I, I think you're right. From what I know, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of barely scratched the surface because so many of us in this country are not familiar with seaweed being a staple of our diet. It's more of a, of a gourmet wrap around your sushi or you maybe you occasionally will get a seaweed salad if you're in a very progressive place. But I agree with what you said. It's likely that these, these foods are way more nutritious than the salad we could grow in our uh, lettuce from our yards. And I think the, um, the opportunity of there being so little input needed, assuming you have an unpolluted patch of coastal water to grow this, um, the fact that you can put these lines of kelp seeds out in the winter and, and they, you know, the upwelling of nutrients from the deeper waters is all they need and they grow and grow and grow in the winter. That is a phenomenal opportunity. I think the challenge is the education and having these wonderful cooks that are able to, you know, uh, introduce this to populations and, and then to scale that up. But I'm, I've read also that the kelp, the large scale kelp farms have a, have a real opportunity like a forest, a aqua, aquaculture forest to sequester carbon dioxide and, and to grow faster than a forest on land. So that's another whole aspect of the climate mitigation, climate change mitigation opportunity. But I'm, I'm thrilled to hear about it being as big of a, uh, of a development in Maine as it already is. Well, thank you to uh, Jane. Thank you so much you. for your insight and for the uh, questions. Uh, please don't uh, leave us. We're going to uh, open the question process up to the wider uh, webinar uh, audience here. And uh, questions may be directed uh, along the way to you. But um, let's uh, begin with this one uh, for uh, our, our principal speaker. Uh, th this is Connie writing, delighted to see your discussion included seaweed. We know from the perspective of both human health and environmental health, humanity should be focusing, we should be focusing our eating habits on plants, uh, not seafood or meat. Um, but then the, the challenge, how do you actually uh, inspire people to make that kind of change. I mean, I personally liked uh, the relabeling, uh, not seaweed, sea vegetables, but that just brings to mind the problem that any um, advocate of healthy eating has when we suggest to people that they eat their vegetables. Uh, what, what tips have you picked up uh, perhaps over the years engaging people um, and uh, wh whether they are cooks or entrepreneurs in, uh, in, in this new niche, uh, what tips have you picked up 
that you think might actually persuade people to make a shift toward greater vegetables, but then to see vegetables? Well, being someone who grew up uh, right next to a Portuguese mother who was, you know, always uh, sort of with the stew uh, from the ocean, I am so enamored by the next generation, and I met, I really featured, you know, Brianna Warner, and you know that was purposeful because uh, when we look at you know who we're training and we look at who's coming in to particularly the sea vegetable business, and where you know you've really got hundreds of species, they're very complex. There's a lot of innovation needed, but the most extraordinary thing is that they're mostly young women who are women-owned businesses, and they're pioneering a lot of this, and they're, they're leading, you know, the charge. And, and that's, that's very, very exciting for, you know, the older people like me that, you know, who, who really want to mentor and, you know, help people like that. So, um, and then, of course, I did mention the celebrity chefs, and, you know, Barton Seaver, for example, uh, he used to be uh, almost everything ab 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 about Barton Siva would be anti-aquaculture. Uh, if you look at his past, he uh, he denigrated salmon, he did, you know, and then he completely changed. And now he gives these fabulous talks, you know, that af affect, you know, the Culinary Institutes of America, the people who are way beyond the sushi, sushi chefs, the, the, you know, sometimes the line cooks he's affecting. And, you know, as we start, to sort of see a greater amount of knowledge base on our menus. And we start to see it in, in front of our, uh, you know, in the, in the retail shops, like I mentioned the heritage uh, seaweed place. People are, the young people particularly are gonna start changing. And, and, and I guess that's my only hint is I didn't show a couple of slides. We, there's a lot of sub subsidies that, you know, the scientists are giving the young entrepreneurs, like we're providing seed for them, we're providing training courses to get them going. And the state of Maine has done a fabulous job with this limited permit access system that allows them to experiment young people. I walked into a room in Brunswick, Maine uh, for a training session about a year ago. And not only was I the oldest man in the room, a person in the room, but there was about 40 or 50 people. And they might, I say the average age was 20, 30 years old. And so attracting that number of people into the experimentation, the innovation economy, um, you know, that's, that's very exciting. And if it could be a model for other places in the world, you know, that, uh, you know, is, is really targeting the schools, you know, targeting uh, the next generation with this, with some of these concepts we talked about. Yeah, you know, fascinating. Uh, well, a number of the questions have to do with um, seaweed, sea vegetables. Um, one of them uh, asks about logistics. Uh, suppose it is successful on the coasts. Um, well, let me ask this in terms of geography. What coasts of North America are uh, usable in terms of uh, uh, aquaculture of seaweed. Uh, I tend to associate it with the more rocky areas, uh, Pacific Coast and then uh, New England. Um, but uh, what areas, but uh, what does it look like? I mean, it, it, as you look into the future, what does it look like in terms of a distribution system? Um, how can this be more than just uh, the, the trendy seafood restaurant, let's say in Boston or San Francisco? So there's a lot to unpack there, Ron. But one of the, so the seaweeds are very diverse. So you you know you have tropicals and you have just the you know the thousands of species. And we all, even though we have scientists <laughs> that know their life cycles, a lot of them haven't been you know sort of completely closed in captivity to actually you know grow them in hatcheries, nurseries, and then in in the ocean or in tanks. I mean, so they're you know. You can grow dulse, one of the more favorite sea vegetables, in tanks, uh, you know, on land with with seawater. So it, it, the diversity, um, it, we're not limited to just some of our thoughts of lines in the water. Um, if we do decide to have more lines in the water, then we will face the challenges of making the system uh, non-destructive of marine mammals, particularly right whales, 
et cetera, ad infinitum. So the taught system that we developed, as well as you know, breaking strengths and knowing that you know, if anything did happen, you know, in proper sighting, you know, out of the the pathways of you know historical pathways, but we know, we know these mammals are are are, are changing their their migration patterns. So um, we have to have smart sighting. We have to have smart engineering. And, and we have to think about the worst case scenario if, we're, if this is going to expand. Now, the good news is, for, for the, to answer your question about the, the, the cold water stuff, most of the kelps are in the winter. So we have the high iodine kelps, like the saccharina, the sugar kelps, and then we have the lower iodine kelps, the, the, the alarias. Some people say alaria is much more delicious than the, than the sugar kelps. So, We've got a lot of opportunities with the cold waters, and you're right. You just imagine, imagine Alaska. Okay, so the the size of the potential farming systems that we're talking about. Uh, Alaska has a lot of logistics, though, in getting it into the populated areas. However, you know, if you look at some of the Caribbean and some of the the South Atlantic places, they have huge amounts of sargassum, and sargassum is a traditional uh, species that are, are used in, in, in cuisine in, in many cultures. Um, so, and then we have the markets, of course, we, we can't really talk about Asia, but I will. I mean, and that's pretty much Carrageenan, you know, and that's, that's a big industrial market for seaweeds when, you know, again, they're, they're the largest producer of not only fish, but, you know, of seaweeds also. And that's all entering, believe it or not, you know, we eat, if you brushed your teeth today, um, you know, there's carrageenan from seaweeds in it. And usually that's from the big, you know, global industrial processing markets. So is it possible to imagine, I mean, this is a question posed by Timothy. Uh, is it possible to imagine um, industrialized scale in terms of um, seaweed? Uh, I mean, it, 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 does it have that kind of potential uh, as you Im imagine the cultural change that would be required? Americans don't eat this, um, but if a cultural change could be achieved, uh, what, what would it look like uh, to have an industrial scale um, use of uh, seaweed? Yeah, and this is where we get into these, this issue of scale. So um, once we get out of the coastal zone for a lot of these seaweeds, then we, we're limited by nutrients. So we have to think clearly. Once you get out into the larger ocean outside of the rich coastal zone, you're limited by nutrients. And so um, it takes, it's gonna take a sort of a heroic effort, you know, upwelling devices. We don't wanna fertilize, you know, it, that's, that's a real limitation. One of the other, you know, maybe design uh, options in for a, a future larger scale would be more of a distributed network of smaller scale, like we, we talked about our five line system. That's incredibly productive versus a one line system is, you know, scale, so a, a, a fishing family who operates a five line system is, is marketing about 10 tons. Uh, that's not insignificant if you're getting a dollar wet weight per kilo. That's, that's a good income, okay? So, um, and then if you've got a processing facility, you can imagine a distributed network in the winter, in the non-fishing season, you know, and more of, of the Atlantic Sea Farms model. You know, they're, they're an aggregator, a processor uh, from many different farms. I think they've got if you, uh, today, the one of the scientists she said uh, they've got they twenty or so farmers, and they aggregate from twenty or so farmers. So I think there's um, Tim. I think there's a lot of skepticism about you know some of the the hype about square kilometer or square mile size farms. Help us, help me understand the significance of the coastal zone and, and exactly how you think about it. I mean, are we talking um, a few hundred meters, uh, 10 kilometers? Yeah, so our, 
our, our five, you know, I think it's a good example. I mean, our five line system where we operate um, in from October through May, all the gear has to be removed in the intensive fishing season, the lobstering season, so we have no conflicts on space. So we, we separate from them on space and time. And, and, and that it's acceptable to the regulators, it's acceptable to the, the lobstering community, and indeed they wanna be involved since we're, they know we're working hard you know, with them on a livelihood approach. And uh, rather than, you know, back in the day, um, you know, aquaculture came into a lot of places in, in these new areas, what I call the new geographies and said, you know, we're gonna replace fishing. You know, we're gonna put you out of business or, or we're going to convince you to get out of fishing. And that was a miserable failure. I, I can imagine. Um, you mentioned earlier um, whale migration, and that's a real challenge. And I'm sure many of our listeners have, have thought about that, uh, particularly right whales, uh, the migratory routes very close to the coast. Um, how is that? Uh, well, you, you referenced the taut lines, but um, uh, how do you avoid the conflicts that lead to the injury and the death of whales? Yeah. So I think it's, it's two parts to hear, and they're both uh, science informed. So um, we are actually doing ex experiments in a, a wave tank, a very large flume at the United States Naval Academy. And uh, we're running robo whale, you know, into a line and seeing, you know, what happens? What's the breaking strength? What's the entanglement? Where is the entanglement? And, uh, and so uh, Professor Fredrickson there is, is going to have some real information, okay? So it comes down to like, you know, these are brilliant engineers and it's gotta be submerged, it's gotta be taut, it can't be a slack system that would entangle, it's gotta break, you know, and it can't entangle. So, um, and that's, that's, so that's one part. There's a, there's a real, and, and, and the types of materials, you know, the, the, you know, are we using the right ropes? Are we using, you know, do we need to be, you know, anywhere near the water surface? Can we go deeper, you know? Um, and then smart sighting, you know, a, a lot of the, the exaggeration about aquaculture is that, you know, we're, we're asking for huge new spaces and, you know, are coming into conflict. And, and the reality is, is the, the coastal ocean is very crowded with existing uses. And, and aquaculture is only going to occupy tiny little donut holes, you know, not vast amounts of space in the coastal zone. Uh, and those places have to be, you know, smart sighting. They have to avoid with lots of you know, GIS and, and other databases, like as best as we can to avoid, you know, conflicts and to get the, the, the public and the regulatory acceptance that those are the spaces that, you know, are, are, are best to, you know, they're socially acceptable, they're ecologically acceptable, and they're economically viable. Yeah, thank you. Um... A number of the questions uh, still want to play off uh, the merits, well, the, the, the attraction of beef and other land-based meats uh, over against. And um, uh, one question that's a little more sophisticated along that line asks, well, suppose you have a very local land-based protein source Let's suppose you're living in the central part of the United States, as opposed to a um, additionally shipped. Um, at what point do you kind of break even in terms of environmental impact, uh, or do you ever? Well, you know, uh, some of the cradle to grave, you know, life cycle assessments that we're seeing coming out are are are, are allowing us to to look at those issues very, very clearly. Um, you know, it, it, even down to like the vegan world, you know? So if the vegan world with soybeans imported from, you know, jurisdictions that are having lots of environmental problems like Brazil and, the, and Patagonia, okay, like, 
might not, you know, that might not be as a, if a full life cycle assessment, that might not be a very sustainable choice versus what you're just talking about, which is a, a fish that might be flown in to Chicago from the coast. Um, and so I think people, uh, they really need, uh, seafood is such a knowledge-based, you know, product that, uh, and it's so valuable, it costs you a lot more money you know, than, um, than most, you know, than the chicken or beef that you see in retail, that, you know, making good choices uh, and, and looking at, you know, the nutrition value versus, or like the, you know, I, I was never, never forget, like, you know, when we started looking at, you know, meat, true, like, uh, you know, a meat production and antibiotics, there was a big discussion about antibiotics and salmon at one time. And then Norwegians, you know, now go almost down to zero antibiotics. They don't use them in the salmon farms. Um, and then we started looking at, you know, California intensive beef production in the feedlots. And we found uh, that almost all of the, the cows were, uh, have antibiotic plugs put in, you know, prophylactically into their necks. And, and similarly with, with commercial chicken, you know, again, cheap retail commercial chicken. Um, there's routine, you know, use of antibiotics that is all, all permitted by our FDA in in uh, these these proteins, and um, you know, not to pit us against each other, but if you were just to look at, you know, a simple energy or food input output of chicken and beef versus salmon, it's it's, it's there's a lot more to it than that because salmon has a lot more omega threes, for example. And I'm not promoting salmon, but I'm saying that there are good sources of salmon in the world today that are better choices than even sometimes some of the, the vegan or plant-based foods that we look we, we see in the market. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, well, it, 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 nobody posed this. This comes out of my own uh, um, imagination here. And I hope the answer is no, but um, uh, is anybody using seafood or rather seaweed for the equivalent of the impossible burger? And again, I'll oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, they're, they're seaweed burgers. Yeah. OK, sure, well, I was hoping the market. answer would be no. But any thoughts on that? I mean, uh, do you see that as a, a good sign or a bad sign? Well, the molecules in seaweeds are so complex and diverse that pretty much with certain processing, you can make them almost into anything you want to, <laughs> uh, including plastic bottles. Uh, so, and, and single use pa packaging. I, I mean, the, it's phenomenal, you know, what the uh, natural products chemists are coming up with on what's, what's in seaweeds. Well, that in itself is intriguing. Uh, and you sound, I think, somewhat excited about the future of that, of that natural product chemistry. Is that yeah, I mean, uh, the, European, the European Union, uh, particularly in the Netherlands, are, are working on you know, biorefineries as we speak, as, as well as you know, larger scale seaweed farms that are you know, in rural areas of the Nordic countries. Um, that would be adding to the uh, ingredient market in, in foods. So, you know, the, the, the packaged foods that, you know, the cereals, et cetera, that we, we all consume and uh, adding it as a, another ingredient into it and, and packaging and labeling it for, for the attributes of that ingredient. Um, our colleague Osh, uh, Oliver Gregerson at Ocean Rainforest in the Faroe Islands is actually moving all of this product into a biorefinery in Denmark right now. So that's that's actually happening, uh, the, the ingredient market. And the excitement here is around the new range of uh, possibilities from seaweed. Possibilities that you don't get from land-based plants. Is that correct? Yeah, the, I, I guess the you know, what a lot of us see is that they're so productive and they, I mean, imagine a plant that grows in the middle of the winter with low light, with no nutrients <laughs> and it grows, you know, to meters long, you know, um, 
you know, what kind of land plant can do that? as well as be a storehouse of all of this, not all macronutrients, but all of these incredibly important micronutrients that we know very little about from the ocean. It's a scavenger of those. So, you know, in many ways, well, first of all, it's productivity. It's just spectacular, you know, versus any other land plant. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, our time really has uh, expired here, but there's one question that I wanted to uh, refer to here at the end because um, it, it, uh, it's intriguing and uh, it's, it's intended for you, of course, Barry, but uh, I, th I think um, Maynard and all of the others who are listening who plan to be at Star Island this summer, you might want to take this into account. So this is an anonymous attendee. Thinking on a small scale, are there suggestions on how Star Island could perhaps begin to harvest and offer sea vegetables in its dining room during the summer? And she, uh, she doesn't add uh, during a particular conference, but we can all think of one that might be there. So Barry, any thoughts? I mean, suppose, suppose there was a serious inquiry from the food service at Star Island. Would you tell them, well, we're not quite there yet? Or would you oh, say- Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. I'm smiling, I'm smiling ear to ear because- Okay, go ahead. Um, First of all, I hope to join you because uh, it's one of the greatest times of my life is being with you, uh, you know, during the last conference. Um, but- um, well, one of the ones that would be easy is hooking up with Atlantic Sea Farms and buying some of their products. However, this one is much more exciting. Um, right across on Appledore Island is our colleague, uh, Michael Chambers, who is running a seaweed farm together with the Isles of Shoals Marine Lab. And you remember we had the director uh, come and give a talk to us at Star Island during our last conference. So they have growing sea vegetables right on your doorstep. So you could maybe get some fresh product directly. And maybe we could import a chef to, uh, to cook it up for some of us. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And You're on welcome. that note, I think we will end and turn it back over uh, so, to um, Maynard. So uh, Ron, uh, Ron, I have a question that uh, may be directed to Jane while she's still here, because this is a special day um, and there, um, I'm interested in the decision makers, meaning politicians and others, um, who can uh, have a critical role in building the future of these industries that uh, Barry has, uh, has mentioned. Uh, Jane, are you still there? Yes, I am. Yes, okay. I am. So tell us uh, what, what's going on in Washington and elsewhere. Well, this is actually the Ocean Climate Action Virtual Lobbying Day on Capitol Hill. I believe that it has been um, led by a group of organizations, particularly the uh, Monterey uh, location of Middlebury College. Their ocean, I believe, have an ocean institute. There are over 650 either individuals or individuals and organizations represented, and they are approaching their representatives in Congress to get them to support a variety of bills under the, um, the, the title is the Climate Action and Ocean Health uh, set of legislative uh, bills that are being proposed. And they're presenting their support for everything from aquaculture, sustainable fisheries, to um, pro, uh, mitigating for rising seas and also offshore uh, renewable energy generation from the ocean. So it's an exciting day for ocean climate advocacy on Capitol Hill. Okay, good, thank you very much. And one last question for Barry, it has to do with the United Nations 2030 uh, goals, would we call them goals? Uh, that yeah, SDGs. Yeah. Uh, how, what is your feeling, given the innovation in the Netherlands and Norway and other places that you've mentioned, what is your feeling about the, uh, the impact on the seas uh, on those goals? Are we, are we lagging behind 
uh, as much as we are with the atmosphere and CO2 carbon emissions, for example, are, are, are we a little bit out in front relative to the, the ocean's uh, goals? Well, what, what's the situation well, in the United Nations goals? Yeah, well, we pay a lot of attention to the SDGs uh, because it's a, a global blueprint for our sustainable future, uh, you know, getting together as a globe and, and trying to implement the high arching values of the SDGs. So it's more than just, you know, SDG, I think it's seven, you know, 14 or life underwater. Um, aquaculture or, or sort of ocean issues touch a lot of the SDGs. And so one of the things that we're doing with my, our colleagues is, is trying to show that, you know, aquaculture touches, you know, many of the SDGs. And so we, in the Rio convention, you know, back, back when, before the millennium development goals, it was all about aggregating to food, energy, water, waste, and shelter. And so expanding that out now to the 17 SDGs, one of the things that we're doing as a community, you know, global community is saying, you know, we're not just the life underwater. We're not just like sort of one SDG. What we do is touching all of the other SDGs and, and, and trying to articulate that to global decision makers. Now, uh, unfortunately, um, we've gotten boxed. You know, the ocean is just in one SDG and so is aquaculture. And we think that's unfortunate and we're gonna try to break through that. Uh, we have a conference, um, the Global Conference on Aquaculture is gonna be in China, uh, we hope in the fall. And we're gonna articulate that to you know, global decision makers in the UN, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think it's really important for, you know, the Paris Climate Accords, of course, that gets all of the press, but what doesn't get as much press in the US and, and also Canada, I find, is how the rest of the world is aligning to the sustainable development goals. Like the government of Finland has aligned all of its ministries with the SDGs. And, um, you know, so I, you know, the governors, I rarely hear, if ever, mention of the SDGs. Um, and I've certainly not heard our new president mention the SDGs. And, and I think that's unfortunate. And we all have a responsibility to put that front and center, you know, in front of all of our decision makers at all different levels of government. Of government. Okay, listen, that's, uh, that, we can accept that as your last word, I think. And, okay. and, uh, Ron, um, thank you so much for uh, your leadership here and Barry for your presentation and Jane for your insights. So um, I look forward to uh, how we can continue this conversation.